You'll hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear a young student asking the social organizer of his school for information about organized trips. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. Good morning. How can I help you? I understand that the school organizes、um, trips to different. Yes, we run five every month: three during weekends and two Wednesday afternoon trips. There are five trips every month, so five has been written in the notes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning. Good morning. How can I help you? I understand that the school organizes、um, trips to different. Yes, we run five every month: three during weekends and two Wednesday afternoon trips. What sort of places? Well, obviously it varies, but always places of historical interest, and also which offer a variety of shopping because our students always ask about that. And then we go for ones where we know there are guided tours because this gives a good focus for the visit.、Um, do you travel far? Well, we're lucky here, obviously, because we're able to say that all our visits are less than three hours' drive. How much do they cost? Again, it varies between five and fifteen pounds a head, depending on distance. Uh huh. Oh, and we do offer to arrange special trips if you know there are more than twelve people. Oh, right. I'll keep that in mind. And、uh, what are the times normally? We try to keep it pretty fixed so that that students get to know the pattern. We leave at eight thirty a.m. and return at six p.m. We figure it's best to keep the day fairly short. Oh yes. And、um, how do we reserve a place? You sign your name on the notice board. Do you know where it is? Uh huh. I saw it this morning. And we do ask that you sign up three days in advance, so we know we've got enough people interested to run it, and we can cancel if necessary, with full refund, of course. That's fine. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. And what visits are planned for this term? Right. Well, I'm afraid the schedule hasn't been printed out yet, but、uh, we have confirmed the dates and planned the optional extra visits, which you can also book in advance if you want to. Oh, that's all right.、Uh, if you can just give some idea of the weekend ones, so I can. You know, work out when to see friends, etc. Oh, sure. Well,、uh, the first one is St Ives. That's on the thirteenth of February, and we'll have only sixteen places available because、uh, we're going by minibus. And that's a day in town with the optional extra of visiting the Hepworth Museum. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um. Then there's a London trip on the sixteenth of February. 
and we'll be taking a medium-sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. And let's see, the optional extra is the Tower of London. Oh, I've already been there. Yeah. Uh, after that, there's Bristol on the 3rd of March. Where? Bristol. B-R-I-S-T-O-L. OK. That's um, in a different minibus with 18 places available. Oh, and the optional extra is a visit to the SS Great Britain. OK. We're going to Salisbury on the 18th of March. And that's always a popular one because the optional extra is Stonehenge. Ah. So we're taking the large coach with 50 seats. Oh, good. And then the last one is to Bath on the 23rd of March. Oh, yes. Is Bath the Roman city? Yes, that's right. And that's in the 16-seater minibus. And where's the optional visit? It's to the American Museum. Well worth a visit. OK, well, that's great. Um, thanks for all that. My pleasure. Oh, by the way, if you want more information about any of the trips, have a look in the student newspaper. OK. Or have a word with my assistant. Her name is Jane Yentob. That's Y-E-N-T-O-B. Right, I've got that. Thank you very much for all your help. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the trips. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear the information about tickets to one of the royal palaces in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. So you've finally decided to start a fitness program and are now on the lookout for the perfect gym to join. Fitnessland is an ideal gym for both group trainings and individual workout. We offer you a variety of sports facilities, which will make your training effective and pleasant. One of the most famous are our yoga classes. We have seven different yoga programs, including Yoga Lates, Yoga Nidra and Hatha Yoga. We also want to open pilot section soon, which will combine relaxation techniques and keep fit exercises. For those people who seek cardio and fat burn workouts, we offer a lot of active classes. For instance, if you love dancing, you can go to our step dance classes. These classes are famous for their intensive rhythm, and include many elements from dancing classes and aerobics classes. At the moment we don't have aerobics or belly dance programs, so step dance can be a good alternative. We also offer great barbell workouts for people who want to build muscle. These classes use very effective strength training strategy and are very helpful for both men and women. There is also a kickboxing room in our gym, where you can find all essential facilities to practice kickboxing yourself and group programs are likely to open in the next season. But Zumba fitness programs and stretching workouts are already running, so be quick to take part in these wonderful activities.
Now listen and answer question 16 to 20. And now I'd like to present you the timetable of fitness programs for the coming week. Monday is dedicated to muscle building activities. You'll begin the weekly program with a full body training split, meaning you'll train all major body parts in each workout. Such fitness classes are designed by famous bodybuilders and sport professionals who are passionate for training others. On Tuesday we offer a variety of fat loss activities. These are high intensity classes that require a lot of physical effort. So we recommend to drink much water during such classes. We also have something called healthy body activities. These activities run on Wednesday. During these programs, you'll do keep fit exercises in a moderate rhythm, alternating upper body and lower body workouts. The next day come relaxation activities. These activities are developed for physical, mental and spiritual practice, and include different kinds of yoga and pilots. Friday is the last day of the week with group activities, in particular interval trainings. Such programs involve series of low to high intensity exercise workouts, interspersed with rest or relief periods. We hope that you'll find your ideal activities in this timetable. But don't forget that you can train individually any day of the week. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a scientific discussion about how people experience pain. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. As you listen to the first part of the discussion, answer questions 21 to 25. Scientists at University College London have made a discovery which makes mice pain-free and have reversed painlessness in a woman with a rare condition. I'm joined by Dr Natasha Curran, consultant in anaesthesia and pain medicine at University College London Hospitals, and by Professor John Wood, lead author of the study and a neuroscientist at UCL. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Natasha, perhaps we can start with perhaps a rather basic question, which is, why do we experience pain at all? What's its purpose? Pain is highly preserved in humans because we need pain to, to prevent us further damaging ourselves. However, what we know in many people is that pain continues past when it's useful for us. And we're all familiar with the idea of sort of feeling pain, but what is happening inside one's body? So when I stub my toe and I, and I scream and shout, what's actually happening inside my body from that moment? Well, receptors in your toe are getting stimulated and they send messages down your nerves which end up in your brain. And in your brain, various things happen. In one part of your brain, which is the somatosensory cortex, that's the part of the brain that says it's your toe that's feeling the pain or the injury rather than your, your hand or your head. So that's one part, but then it's much more complex than that because pain is a, an emotional experience. So it's connected then to all the other parts of the brain, which they, they give us our experience of pain, if you like. So that depends on our the context in which we're having pain, our past experience, what we think the pain means, lots of factors. And then also it connects to what we think we're going to do about the pain. So parts of the brain light up, if you like, which, how are we going to respond to the pain that we're experiencing? How big a problem is pain and how big a burden is this for people to be dealing with? In the UK, it's massive. In 2011, the National Pain Audit reported that 31% of men and 37% of women live with persistent pain. So that's 40 million people. Their quality of life is very, very poor, much lower than other medical conditions. It's as bad as people who have, for example, Parkinson's disease. One of the reasons it's really important to understand this is because we know that we can actually help these people if they attend specialist pain management services. Mm -hmm. We can improve their quality of life. And specialist pain management services have doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, and potentially occupational therapists, psychiatrists, in order to help them. 
John, how thorough is our understanding of pain? Is, is, for example, chronic pain different to the pain we feel when we knock our knee or, or, or have a headache? Um, well, the, there are clearly enormous mechanistic differences, and it's very striking how uh, mechanisms to experience pain are conserved across evolution. And pain is really an essential survival mechanism. So the mechanisms that occur in people uh, are quite similar to those that occur in in mice, for example, and so we can make uh, comparisons between animal models and and the human experience. But uh, we really know very little at all about how pain is experienced centrally. Um, There are various parts of the brain that have been correlated with the experience of pain, but this is very, very uh, weakly done. In fact, to define a precise locus in the brain where pain is perceived has proved completely elusive. So the way we feel pain and the intensity of pain is is, uh, regulated by all kinds of things like circadian rhythms, emotional state, and we don't have many insights into how this actually works. Why is consciousness linked so much with pain and pain with consciousness? Well, there's um, a wonderful book by Philip K. Dick, uh, the person who wrote so many perceptive science fiction uh, novels, and he says that pain and beauty are the two underlying themes of uh, human nature. In fact, you know, trying to understand where the brain perceives beauty is just as difficult as trying to understand where the pain is perceived in the brain. Consciousness obviously is required for any kind of sensation. Pain is just one of those types of sensations that we're aware of when we're alive and awake. Uh, well, as an anaesthetist, that's part of our main role. We, surgery can't go ahead unless we have anaesthesia because in, obviously in the modern world we, and, and in most parts of the world we want to be able to anaesthetise so that people don't experience the pain of surgery. And we know that there are some states of consciousness where people can undergo quite um, stimulating and unpleasant to most people experiences such as surgery. But for most people they need to be unconscious, so in a state of anaesthesia. Now listen, and answer questions 26 to 30. It sounds like we have some clues as to how pain works, although there's a lot that we don't know. Is that why it's so difficult to find ways to block it, because we don't really understand the mechanisms particularly well? I think what we do understand is the kind of area that Natasha works in, which is the the sensation of tissue damage by specialised nerves in the skin and the muscle and the viscera, and how those nerves are activated and send electrical signals. So the the activity of those nerves is is absolutely required for most pain states. Uh, And so by focusing on them, Mm -hmm. we can actually find ways to treat pain without understanding anything about pain perception. And so that's the focus of interest of most pain scientists. And that's where anaesthetists also are working in terms of blocking the drive into the central nervous system. But pain perception itself is, is completely mysterious. A good example of this might be one I explain to my patients, which is a phantom limb pain. Listeners might have heard of this already. It's when people can have a, a painful limb once they've had an, an amputation. So a person may have had to have a, an amputation for a medical reason, such as the leg in this case, let's say, might become gangrenous. Mm -hmm. So that's done under anaesthesia as a surgical procedure. But after the operation and the wound's healed, then people who are unfortunate enough to get this um, phenomenon can then experience sensations in that leg which has been removed, and not just sensations, that if they've had pain there before, they can often experience pain. So even though the leg's not there, it's no longer physically present, the patient still feels that their leg's there and it can be painful. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's very distressing. And it also gives us the notion that pain is not just in the the nerves, the the, the peripheral nerves, the ones in the leg. Mm. It's modulated in the brain. Yeah, if I can come in there. Pain is nothing to do with the peripheral nerves. Pain is in the brain. Mm -hmm. But there is a requirement for nervous input from the periphery uh, in order to feel pain uh, in, in almost all states. There are situations where you can get pain after a stroke because you have lesions in your thalamus mm-hmm. and that's obviously some form of central pain syndrome but almost all inflammatory pain states like rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis or diabetic neuropathy all these chronic pain states require the activity of peripheral nerves and that's what we try to block without understanding the perception of the the painful stimulus itself. 
So it's actually it's an interesting point though, that John was saying about us needing stimulation of our nerves sort of throughout our body, our mm-hmm. peripheral nerves. So what's happening in the case of a phantom limb? Well, there's several theories and there's probably not one overarching thing that's happening. We know that pain can create a memory of itself, just like any other experience that people have. You might have you know, heard some records on the radio recently about David Bowie, for example, and that takes you, listening to that record takes you back to a certain point. So listening to music can take mm-hmm. you to a certain point in time. And some sort of stimulation, for example, movement in that limb or something else, which is the peripheral that John's talking about, that peripheral input, can cause a learnt sensation to be re-experienced. It's not that the person's actively trying to recall that, that painful experience, who would want that? But it, it, So it's like anything that's learnt. The, the nervous system's really, really good at learning things. That's how we've learnt to do all the, you know, the great things mm-hmm. that, that humans and people do in their lives. Unfortunately, it's almost like it can get switched on for some sensations, and then the person continues to feel that, ex- that pain, even though there's no obvious mechanistic reason for them to continue to feel it. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about factors you should consider when creating advertising materials and the effects they can have on your product sales. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello class and welcome back to Marketing Strategies. This week I will expand upon last week's lecture by talking about factors you should consider when creating advertising materials and the effects they can have on your product sales. Lesson 1. Limit your advertising to the geographic area of your target market. Though you may have a product that people want in a large area, the distance that customers are willing to travel is a significant factor in their choice of where to purchase that product. Take this example. If you're really hungry and decide you want a burrito, would you choose the restaurant that is a block from your apartment or the one that is just as good or even slightly better, across town. Of course, you'd pick the closer restaurant. Next, there's the method of communication to your target market. How do you decide among radio ads, TV commercials, flyers, or even word of mouth? While we often think of the visual presentation of ads, there's much more to advertising than the look. Studies show that consumers are much more likely to remember advertising slogans if there's also a sound plate. Did you know that your sense of smell is closely linked with memory? Think about Mandy's candy store up the road. Every time you walk past it, you can just smell the chocolate, right? I bet you can almost smell it now. Just mentioning the name brings about the smell memory and, in turn, a chocolate craving. What better way to sell chocolate bars? Obviously, sometimes appealing to the senses isn't the most practical way to advertise. For example, it's a good idea to come up with a marketing strategy that adapts to the product, especially digital products. The flexibility of this kind of products is extremely important, so it's very common for advertisers to form one single layout for all of their ads, the visual, the medium, even the majority of the content, and simply update the ad each time they come out with a new version. Remember, advertising is all about stirring up the right feeling in your potential customers, whether by stimulating the senses, appealing to the intellect, and so on. 
Once the customer experiences the ad, the important thing is his or her reaction. Someone could love the ad you made, but unless he or she considers buying the product, you failed to get the reaction you were looking for. So once you have successfully reached your target customer, and you have his or her business, often you will want to expand to a larger market. More often than not, the same marketing strategies you used in your small campaign may not work for a larger audience. The larger you scale your product, the more factors you must consider. For instance, Apple operates worldwide, so they must tailor their advertising for each market they enter. Often you'll see Apple ads on international flights that appear not only in English, which is the lingua franca of most regions, but also in the native languages of the majority of passengers. I travelled to Russia last week, and it was really interesting to see the same Nike ad that I've seen a hundred times, except this time it was in Russian. Okay, going back to the medium of the advertisement. Even after choosing to create print ads instead of radio announcements, television commercials, etc., there is more to consider. If you print your ad in a newspaper, it will be read by a far different audience than if you print your ad in a popular magazine. Would you put an ad for the new Justin Bieber album in a newspaper? Probably not, because that product is most suitable for youths. Let's face it. Do you know anyone under the age of twenty-five that buys a newspaper? No. Now let's try a few strategy exercises. Imagine you are a company that is aiming to improve the environment by making products that reduce human waste. How would you advertise your product? Clearly, it would send the wrong message if you put up flyers or other materials that cause lots of waste paper. Consider instead putting commercials on the Health Channel or buying ad space on websites like UNESCO. Or here's another example: What is one great place to advertise suntan lotion? How about a swimming pool? It has the exact group of people that need the product. All right, one last thing: Let's say you're filming a commercial for a water filter pitcher. What would be good scenery to use for the background? Think about somewhere calm and relaxing with clean, fresh water. Can't you see how much more effective a commercial with the beautiful scenery and flowing rivers of a national park would be than, say, water dripping from a tap? So to wrap things up today, think about the geography of your target market, the type of marketing material you should use, and the most effective way to appeal to the customer. In order to make a successful ad campaign, that is all I have for you today. Make sure to read through Chapter Eight for Monday if you have not done so already. Okay, now I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of Section Four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet.